Hi, I have got a tale to tell you that is quite difficult, full of lots of drama, and it's all part of cancer causing me problems, and it started on Australia Day for me. It was Australia Day. We woke up bright and early. I slept in a little bit more, but husband and kids woke up and we had some piano lessons to begin the day with the children that learn piano. Our wonderful piano teacher comes to our house and teaches them on a Friday morning. The teacher was telling <laughs> me last week that she went home and said to her husband, Caitlin really does not look well. And she was right. I did not feel well. I had got a PET scan because I was worried about SVC and things clogging. I was starting to feel a bit uh, swollen in the face and in my eyes and all of these type of things. But I'd got an S uh, I had got a PET scan NGO of my blood vessels and everything the week before and they said they can't see anything. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. So when I woke up on Australia Day not feeling well, I just kept telling myself, you've had a scan, you don't know what it is, you've just got to keep persisting. I was kind of trudging through the day. Uh, the children had piano lessons. Uh, the boys headed to Brisbane to watch the cricket. The test cricket was on. Jonty is a big cricket fan. So he had organized tickets. Trent was off at a youth camp, had a great time out in the country at a youth camp. And that left Imogen and I at home because Alex and three of the boys had gone to Brisbane to watch the cricket, had a wonderful game at the cricket. Imogen and I were staying around at home and I just was not feeling well. Imogen had been wanting to watch a show on Netflix. So we settled in and started watching Anne with an E. I thought it was a great plan. I didn't have to move much, but I had baskets and baskets of washing and I have been putting it off. If you can look behind, you'll see my Christmas decorations are still up. And even though it was Australia Day, I just have not had huge amounts of energy. And the story that unrolled showed me exactly why I didn't have huge amounts of energy, but I've just been doing what I can do and it's in small amounts. So I am just not getting through normal household jobs as quickly at the moment. So I thought, even though I'm feeling badly, I'm just going to do the folding, sit back, watch Anne with an E, and at least I'll have something done by the end of the day. Every now and again, we'd stop and Imogen and I would go and put the folding into people's rooms so that they could put it away and I'd keep folding. So I ended up folding four baskets. Happy Australia Day to me and everybody who got their clothes folded at last. Uh, and it wasn't too bad. I was folding, I was feeling gross, but I kind of got into a rhythm and I was folding away, watching, and then I'd stop for a little bit and just watch. And the day was progressing like that. Now, because the boys had gone to the cricket and youth camp and different things, I thought I should do something special for Immy. And I thought I'll go out for dinner. So I have a bit of footage of going out to dinner with Immy. <laughs> it's Australia Day. Imogen, I'm sure is excited about going out for dinner. I'm not feeling well. I think I do look puffy. Um, but anyway, the boys are down at cricket and Immy and I are going to go out and have some dinner. Okay. Oh, hang on. A great big chocolate sundae. And there's mine. Very fitting for Australia Day, a green and gold burger. And Immy's got nuggets and gravy. Did you notice? <laughs> me going out with Immy that I was not looking well and that my face was really swollen. So we went out. 
I really was not feeling well. I didn't eat everything, which is not usual for me. But it was lovely going out with her. When we got home, she wanted to continue watching the Netflix series. And I said, I know we're close to the end, but can we just have a shower, get into our PJs? I'm not going to do any more folding. Let's just relax and watch another episode before we go to bed. So that was a good plan. However, as I was finishing in the shower, I was in fact talking to a friend on Messenger and finishing up things. And I went like this, so I've got a shirt, a jacket on at the moment, went like this. And all of a sudden I saw my pick line was bleeding. And I thought, oops, that isn't supposed to happen. And a bit strange. And I, I thought with the combination of my head feeling so bad all day and such, I had such tightness and it was starting to get a little bit harder to breathe. And also I thought, oh, I've done too much folding. I've overdone it. So the pick might be bleeding for that. So I contacted a friend of mine who's a nurse and said, should I go up to ED? Because you all know that I always delay going up to ED. And she asked a few questions and said, yes, go up to ED. I'm praying for you. I have to continue my story outside because I was trying to update, I was trying to update you and the kids came home. It's just getting noisy inside. I contacted the friend who I was messaging when I first noticed that my port was bleeding. She said, can I help you? And I said, yes, I need someone to drive me to the hospital. So she did that, sat with my daughter. Uh, my sister arrived eventually and went home with my daughter. And I was sent to get a new CT angio. Uh, <laughs> then I did a lot of waiting uh, in emergency. And I really was feeling worse as you can probably see, my face, in fact, started looking worse as well. Hidi, once again, I'm feeling terrible. I just feel so swollen. And um, my pick was bleeding, which is the thing that sparked me to come in, but I think it's all the swollenness that I'm more worried about, to tell you the truth. Unlike the week before, the results from the CT angio that night in emergency showed that I did have a blockage in my stent. So all the swelling and the pressure I was feeling was blood not being able to circulate around my Once body. Once they had identified that problem, they realized then that there was a problem with my stent that would need intervention and they weren't going to be able to give that level of intervention in Toowoomba. So they started talking with the hospital that I had received the stent from originally and there was no one on call that public holiday and on the weekend that would be able to help me. So they contacted a public hospital in Brisbane, the Princess Alexandra, and uh, they were talking to the radiation interventionist down there who said that they would have to put uh, maybe replace the stent or do something and so in the meantime I had to wait for an ambulance to take me to Brisbane because it was deemed too risky because everything was so swollen that uh, anything could happen while I was waiting for that stent so they weren't sure whether I was going to need the uh, some surgery right that very evening but they did give me steroids immediately and those steroids in fact calmed everything down so once everything started calming down uh, everybody stopped panicking so much it, they stopped panicking in Brisbane as well and the ambulance didn't arrive until 7 a.m. so I stayed all night in emergency. The ambulance took me away the next day very uneventful trip down in the ambulance. Thank goodness they didn't need to do anything for me. Uh, it was quite uncomfortable, in fact, uh, probably because I've got that rod in my spine and just sitting up and bouncing. 
Uh, they kept on moving the back, so that kind of helped. Eventually got there, there was only two ambulance when uh, we got there, so they went, oh great, we're not going to be ramped. Not sure if this is a problem in other countries, but in Australia at the moment, the ambulances arrive and then they get ramped. So somebody has to sit with the patient until the people in the hospital are ready to deal with that patient. So they said, great, uh, there's only two ambulances here. We should be fine. They said it too soon and I got ramped. Um, I'm not sure how long, but eventually Toowoomba started calling the, uh, the Toowoomba ambulances saying, we really need you back. So a Brisbane ambulance took over my and case. So I sat there an oh, hour and a half to nothing much to look at, just a corridor. Eventually I got taken to ED at the PA. Yeah, you're looking better. <laughs> no, I look so fat in the face. Anyway, um, finally out of being ramped. From the PA. yeah at the PA Princess Alexandra Hospital Brisbane and they said that I'm gonna go up to a ward soon I'm just in a little bit of a corridor Alexis. From ramping to what's it called waiting inside the ramping area to the <laughs> ED acute corridor. waiting area the acute waiting area yes. yep so anyway and we're waiting to see whether the procedure's done today tomorrow or Monday Hopefully not Monday, because then I won't be able to finish off my chemo treatment cycle. But anyway, uh, in the public system now, so everything is moving a lot slower, right? And it's weekend, so yeah. work the best on weekends. Yep, yeah. anyway, and here's my newest bruises. That was them trying to put a cannula in last night. The one that they've got Leaking pick one. looks pretty oops bad and that's the pick line that made me go to ed in the first place and during e during that time in ed the radiation interventionist eventually came down and he had a good talk with me on what they were planning to do and because my symptoms had settled and I wasn't finding it as difficult to breathe or anything uh, he said he'd prefer not to so it was Saturday by that point he'd prefer not to uh, do anything on the Saturday because they were scrambling for a team but have everybody a bit more well prepared and do it Sunday morning so we did that uh, it, didn't feel great on Saturday, but yep, we were ready to go on the Sunday morning. I am waiting to get taken away for the surgery uh, today. I feel funny saying it's surgery because it's a local, not a general. Um, a nurse just came by. Um, it's pretty busy. Like, let me just show you. So my room the computer the nurses and there's a toilet and a shower so people just walk straight past I'm getting a heparin injection that's just constantly being fed through to me it's creating all types of dramas in my opinion because I have to get a blood test every few hours to check that it's at the and then they adjust the levels that goes through it to me except as I was explaining yesterday all my and I've got new bruises now um, my veins just keep not working and um, so I keep getting poked and then the vein collapses and also I don't know whether it's chemo but uh, it's really painful when they do it and then we've got all the other beds in there so there's four beds that's my little backpack that oh sorry bag I was given which was lovely thanks to Naomi and my backpack I have to put it back in there before I leave there's a pillow in there so it's a bit squishy anyway I'm really flushed in the face not feeling that well um, because of the bad veins and waiting to um, 
needing the blood test for the heparin last night. Um, the nurse tried it, it collapsed, um, and nobody else could find any veins, so they said they would ring a doctor and get an ultrasound unit up. Doctors just kept saying all night that they couldn't do it. So finally, oh, I'd been kind of waiting up, because you know, hospitals are shocking. You keep on expecting something to happen. And then, um, sorry, there's a message that just came through. You keep on expecting something to happen, so I don't go to sleep because I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna wake up. I'm not gonna sleep properly because I'm gonna be expecting people to come. And then they don't come, of course. And so then I stayed up too late waiting and I was really tired because I only got two and a half sleeps the night before in ED down at Toowoomba. So I finally got to sleep and then they did wake me up and say the doctors were too busy and they can try through my cannula, which they had tried before and there was not enough blood. That was at my insistence um, the first time, but it was before I was hit hooked up to the cannula was hooked up to the heparin so then they had to take it out and f um, take blood away and then get a new lot and hope that um, because it had been into the heparin it wasn't going to be uh, the results too high which I don't know exactly what that means but anyway uh, it worked probably because I realized I'd been nil by mouth all day and most and even the night before I hadn't been drinking a whole heap um, so when I realized that I started drinking a lot more so I think that helped get the blood out of the cannula um, so that was good that I they didn't have to poke me again and I'm really hoping that while they do the procedure they can fix all the pick line up and I can they said I should be having a new pick line and after that I'll be able to use my pick because every time I kind of get really brave, sorry, oh. I kind of get brave and go, okay, they're going to do it and who knows, it might go well this time and it will hurt and I'm like, okay, it will hurt for just a little bit and then you're going to be okay and then next thing you hear everybody going, oh my goodness, we can't do it, oh it collapsed, blah, 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 blah and then I know they have to do it again and at that point I start crying and then even if they give me a break, they come back to do it. I'll just start crying. I just, yeah, I just hate getting my bloods taken. So the sooner I can get a pick in and having picks and knowing that they don't last forever, I'd been preparing myself going, sooner or later the pick's going to stop working and um, they're going to have to use your veins. Uh, it's not like a port. Um yeah so I kind of knew it was coming but um, I didn't expect that I would be needing blood tests every few hours when it came anyway hopefully this will be all over and over soon when I got in to do the surgery they had said to me that they would probably go in through my pick uh, oh the other thing that had been happening is they had taken me off my Xarelto's my blood thinners and they had been putting a heparin lock which I've got a uh, which I referred to in the video and but they had to take bloods and they had to take bloods in Toowoomba and ED as well and my veins are so bad that they were collapsing everywhere so I was pretty much a basket case I was crying I'd be brave the first time they tried to take, take my bloods but I was crying once they tried to take the second time or whatever I, I, I was just really emotional uh, because it just kept failing so I just knew people would keep going oh no we've got it oh I'm really good at taking bloods and then they then it just would not go to plan so I was getting really emotional I was really looking forward my pick had stopped working in Toowoomba ED and uh, it actually had hurt my chest a lot so they had to stop using that it was dangerous and so they'd put a cannula in after many attempts and with ultrasound. When they, I arrived to do the surgery, there was a really lovely team around me. The, uh, the radiation in, the who, uh, interventionist who had talked to us was on call. He was really helpful. Uh, but the cool thing is that I haven't talked about the guy that in the private hospital um, x-ray 
department who had put my stent in originally also worked at the PA, the Princess Alexandra. And he was on call that weekend. So the radiation, uh, I always forget their name, the radiation interventionist that was doing my case had been talking to this doctor because I'm quite complex apparently and been weighing in and so he said look I'm on call but if I'm not called to anything I'll come help so he walked in it was great to see him because I have seen him a few times since and he just knows my case so well whenever they need to do anything they call him which is wonderful so he walked in and they were planning to give me a local and he said oh, I've been looking at the x-rays and I think that we're going to have to go in via the groin because it I don't think it's a clot it's the tumor pushing on the stent we're going to need to reline the stent and she's going to need a general which I was slightly happy about <laughs> because even though the general's not the best I had been awake the whole time they did the stent and that was horrible and I wasn't looking forward to it and also the whole needle thing I was already crying or did I cry afterwards anyway I was crying uh, during that thing as well because they were trying to get cannulas and everything and then they tried to use uh, because they couldn't get a normal vein well they didn't try they well they did try they decided to use an arterial vein which is a bit more of a fancy cannula but when she went in and cut that vein it didn't work the first time so we had to do it again so I'm I'm squeezing one nurse's hand and crying and whatever and they finally got that in me into the theatre, knocked me out and that was all good. Uh, I woke up, it was the quickest time I've ever spent in recovery, they just chucked me straight back to the ward and they had taken out before they, I left recovery though, they'd taken out my arterial line. I arrived back at the ward and I was told that I had to stay in bed for five hours, I couldn't get up and then a blood, a nurse with the blood trolley uh, came to take my blood and she said she was going to have to put a cannula in because or take it use my veins because uh, I'd had a midline inserted not a pick line and they couldn't use a midline and I freaked out I actually started hyperventilating um, everybody froze I, all I can remember is the nurse saying breathe just breathe it's, we're not going to touch your veins we're not going to touch your veins we'll work something out you all you've got to do now is breathe breathe so eventually I got my breath back and they rang the guy who had done the surgery and he said no it's a midline but you can use it as a pick line so you can take blood from it. Uh, they had done it as a midline so a pick line apparently is a lot longer and it had been running through my stent but remember how I've been saying and even way back in Jan uh, November when I thought I was going to have to stay in hospital for my birthday that was another case where I could feel symptoms and I had got a scan and the scan said it was okay and the doctor who had was really familiar with my case said he thought that the um, pick line that was going through my stent was blurring the images so people couldn't tell what was going on so they had to well he decided to just stop it before the stent and that way they could use it as a pick and they could also see clearly on C further CTs. So that was that. We <laughs> could use the pick then and have been using the pick. First night after surgery. Um, that's sore. I slept okay for breakfast now um, I'm worried about getting sick from breakfast because it's lukewarm um, and I've still got a low immune system uh, and it's not nice missing my private hospital breakfast where I get to choose what I want 
um, and I feel very sorry for the ladies. See the toilet across there? There's the ladies. Yeah. Can you see? There's the ladies' bedroom, bed right in front of the toilet door. Poor thing. That's yesterday. That's yesterday's. They kept it for me and it's just been sitting there for hours. And today I had porridge, but I gave up. Plus I like porridge and honey. And that's a cup of hot water, which I won't add either. And I'm not even a huge fan of yes. bananas. So I spent another day in hospital. My sister came to visit. Julian's come and she doesn't know where she's left her car. <laughs> <laughs> so she's gonna do a little extra go on a hunt. <laughs> And then I got, just got suddenly sent home, so yes, that was good. We, uh, My husband had brought me down some flowers from my garden, so I took them and gave them to a lady in the uh, across from me, the poor lady who had her door next to the toilet. Every time I'd walk past, could see her sleeping or whatever, I just felt so bad for her that she was right outside the toilet, so the least I could do was give her some beautiful smelling roses. Okay. So get some water? Yeah. Yes, I went home. It was wonderful because my, yep, yeah, anyway, my son was having a year 12 commissioning service the next day. So I was thinking, yay, I can get to that. However, then I was told to get to chemo the next day during that, so I was disappointed. I got to chemo, I had a fever and the doctor said no chemo. So I was actually relieved to have a fever because I got to my son's commissioning service for year 12 and that was a really special moment. And yeah, uh, the dramas kept happening as the week progressed. But that is a tale for the next video. I have jumped out of the timeline that I was on but I thought it's probably time to update you on where I'm at now. Uh, Does anybody else have veins that are troublesome? Have you got hints uh, so I don't keep crying if they ever need to access my veins? So yeah, please comment in the comment section if you've got any hints. But yeah, thanks for watching. See you in the next vlog about what happened in the next week. Thanks, bye.